Now, let's start the third session on the learning from regional and the country experiences. The chairperson for this session is Deputy Governor Junior Kim here at the Bank of Korea. Please welcome Deputy Governor. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I know this is, is the most difficult time in the day, particularly for those who travel from Europe and the United States. Uh, so I'd like to, I hope this session will wake you up <laughs> if possible. And because we have two distinguished uh, speakers today, uh, first one is Chang Yong Wee from uh, ADB. He's the chief economist of the ADB, and he was former vice chairman of the, the financial supervisory service in, in Korea. And another speaker is uh, Un Gyu Choi. He is actually he's the organizer of this conference. So he's the director of the Economic Research Institute at the Bank of Korea. And also we have two distinguished uh, discussants, one uh, from the Hernan de Vargas, from the deputy governor from the Central Bank of Colombia, and Mr. Uh, Craig Hakio, he's the senior vice president of Kansas Fed. Okay, uh, let's begin with the presentation by uh, Mr. Chang Yong Lee, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's my great honor to have an opportunity to present the impact of quantitative easing on Asia. And, uh, but I'm, I don't know whether I can meet your expectation whether the, my presentation will wake everyone up or not, but uh, I'll try. Uh, uh, actually, this paper tried to uh, study the e uh, effect of quantitative easing on Asia, especially by focusing on the capital flows and uh, uh, impact on financial variables such as uh, uh, exchange rate and interest rate. And the uh, motivation is that, uh, and let me skip many slides. Uh, uh, this morning and the afternoon, we talk a lot, uh, talk a lot about uh, QE. And, but uh, I think the evaluation about QE so far seems to be quite uh, diverse because of the lack of the appropriate data yet but, and the definition, but also I think the philosophy is quite different. Uh, advanced economists believe that QE stabilizes financial market and therefore promote growth in advanced economies. Thus, it must provide a very positive impact on the global economy, especially after the onset of the global financial crisis. On the other hand, emerging economies emphasize the negative spillover effect on capital flows and especially the exchange rate and asset price bubbles. And uh, when we look at the literature, I think we can see many literatures which show that the QE was effective in lowering U.S. long-term interest rate and stimulate uh, growth, especially in the United States. But it looks like the evidence on spillover effect is quite mixed. And the most of the uh, literature which I read so far is analyze whether the capital outflow from the United States increase or decrease after the global financial crisis. So they look at the micro data and macro data, whether the capital outflow from the United States. But on the other hand, my pa uh, actually this paper is joined with uh, Dr. Dong Chol Cho at KDI, I should have mentioned in the beginning. But we try to look at the actually inflow data to out or an outflow data from an Asian country's perspective. Because if you just focus on the outflow from the United States, maybe many U.S. capitals uh, reside in Hong Kong and Singapore and already in outside the U.S. Maybe it's very hard to differentiate outflow directly from the U.S. versus U.S. money outside of the United States. So uh, one of the motivations is look at the uh, cap uh, capital flows and uh, uh, from from perspective of the inflow and outflow to the Asian countries, we actually try to do two things. One is one is eyeball test. So I will show you some kind of comparison of trend of capital flows and composition of capital flows before and after the global financial crisis. So we'll try to sh whether there is a, some extraordinary movement after the global financial crisis. But definitely, uh, this analysis simply identifies noticeable changes after the QE, but uh, this does not necessarily mean the causality because many other uh, factors may be responsible. So with this caveat, uh, let me first show that uh, you know, many patterns. 
And then uh, in the second half, I will try to move my discussion to the, some regression analysis. Okay, this chart shows the private capital inflow to Asia. As you can see, you can see the large volatility around the period of 2008 when global financial crisis coming in. So uh, the level of capital inflow in Asia is about 1.4 trillion in 2007, and it plummeted uh, quite significantly in 2008, and then rebound quite quickly in 2009. Uh, but uh, you know this flow is uh, much uh, largely dominated by the two giants, China and Japan. So on the right side, we want to try to look at the capital flows uh, in terms of percentage of GDP to mitigate the impact of this large two giant. And if you look at the, uh, this Asian 10 countries, capital inflow uh, in, in prior to the crisis, so in 2008, 2009 was, uh, I mean, 2005 to 2007 was about 8.4% in average. And it kept the inflow collapsed to 1.7% in 2008 and 2009, and then rebound to 7.8% uh, in the, uh, 2010 and 2012. So you can see the quite V-shaped uh, pattern of capital inflows to Asia. And uh, uh, if you look at the components, so let's just exclude Hong Kong and uh, Singapore because uh, I find Hong Kong and Singapore as a financial hub has a quite different, uh, uh, you know, the patterns. But if you look at the component, component of private capital inflow to Asia, uh, let me just focus on the ratios. You can see that the uh, uh, foreign direct investment is quite robust despite of the uh, uh, crisis. But uh, you can see that the portfolio investment is quite volatile. And on the other hand, uh, the other flows is kind of volatile, but after the financial crisis, actually the, uh, uh, the uh, inflow of other investment, which is bank loans, has actually increased. So after the crisis, actually the, uh, the portfolio investment hasn't recovered fully in Asia, but uh, the gap was basically uh, you know, uh, maintained by the increase of the other, other, other investment, which is bank loans. And, uh, uh, if, but if you look at the Hong Kong, and from ADB, I have to mention Hong Kong, China. So Hong Kong, China and Singapore, uh, you can see quite different patterns. Uh, actually, as Guan Ho mentioned this morning, uh, for Hong Kong and Singapore, the most volatile capital flows are bank loans. So you can see that the huge uh, volatility of the uh, you know the other investment actually uh, financial hub means that the percentage of GDP this financial flow is enormous right you can see that the 20 to 40 percent of the you know, 60 percent of the you know fluctuation so that is one of the reasons why, why we do not want to put together because they really dominate the whole pictures on the other hand portfolio investment is also volatile but actually it's mostly other investment uh, which was quite volatile in these two countries uh, and to Hong Kong and uh, you know the uh, the Singapore, and for the GT G2 country Japan and uh, uh, China really shows the big differences because of the different uh, stage of uh, financial market opening and development. Uh, in Japan, it's mostly the portfolio uh, fluctuation inflow, and on the other hand, in China, the foreign direct investment is really dominating, and portfolio flow is quite minimal. So mostly the foreign direct investment and then also the uh, you know, bank loans are the major portion of the uh, uh, change of cap uh, capital flows in these two countries. Korea, uh, uh, Guano shows the picture, but uh, Guano shows the kind of uh, monthly pictures, I think it's quarterly, but uh, if you just aggregate it annually, then you can see still the portfolio fluctuation investment was, was the large, you know, dropped most significantly and then recovered quite quickly and uh, you know, bank portfolio also shipped, but uh, it's uh, volatility is less. The difference between what Guano presented and what presented me is that, you know, put, I'm looking at the, some of the annual numbers. So portfolio, the equity investment, that equity investment by foreigners left Korea a long time ago, the Lehman actually, you know, all throughout the year. But after that, but once Lehman started, Finally, the bank uh, loans has left. But in terms of the total amount accumulated within a year, it's a portfolio investment which dropped mostly. Uh, uh, in Taipei, China also uh, shows a very similar pattern as in, uh, as in Korea. The other Asian countries, I think uh, uh, you can see the similar pattern except India. Uh, the share of the capital, uh, the capital inflow fluctuation is relatively smaller because they are less uh, you know, open and their financial market is less developed, but in general, 
uh, you know, the similar patterns, you can observe the similar patterns. Now, uh, let's look at the capital outflow, I think, uh, uh, rather than inflows. And as you can see, uh, one uh, kind of noticeable fact is that in terms of outflow, you can see more fluctuation in other investment than uh, portfolio investment, which is interesting implication in my opinion because uh, many Asians still, uh, you know, don't do many foreign investment equity and stocks. So there's not much room to withdraw. On the other hand, I think this is led mostly by Japan. Uh, Japan's bank uh, actually after the crisis withdraw their investment uh, to the foreign, including Asian region, and then make the uh, capital outflow significantly decline uh, in this period. And uh, so if we toget uh, put together inflow and outflow, this chart shows that the uh, net flows so, and uh, it really shows some V-shaped pattern of recovery in portfolio investment. Uh, on the other hand, it shows that the large increase on bank loans uh, immediately after the 2007. So it's in some sense, faced with a sudden liquidity shortages due to port portfolio investment outflow, Asia responded by accessing more external loans during the great, uh, uh, great financial crisis, global financial crisis. Another interesting fact is reserve accumulation. And here, minus means that the uh, uh, capital outflow, which means there are more reserve accumulation. As you can see, Asians, uh, Asian countries uh, accumulate large reserves each year prior to the crisis. But after the uh, you know, crisis, the, uh, they actually, the reserve accumulation significantly reduced. So actually, uh, uh, sl reserve accumulation slowed down in 2008. And then after the uh, global financial uh, situation becomes sl slightly improved, reserve accumulation uh, move back to the original, but uh, recently the reserve accumulation is uh, slowing down significantly. So, in some sense, uh, the public sector, prior to prior to the uh, uh, pr uh, compared to the private sector, actually public sector used active counter cyclical response uh, to the global financial crisis. So they invest a lot prior to the crisis. During the crisis period, they invest less, and these days, in trend, they are reducing their investment overall. Okay. And uh, all together with the net aggregate, uh, you know, if you put this private sector and public sector together, this shows that net aggregate financial flows. So overall, interesting thing is that overall, Asians are capital exporters, but this is mostly due to the public sector uh, reserve accumulation. But uh, uh, now amount of the capital export from Asia to others are going down. I think so, it's largely due to the uh, two facts. One is that Japan, this graph, everything is included in Japan. Japan is a pure private sector capital exporter. And uh, now after the global financial crisis, the, the export to outside is slightly going down. China is a large public sector capital exporter. And uh, now they, recently, their capital export to outside, I mean reserve accumulation, slowed down significantly. So still uh, Asia is a capital exporter. So we are talking about lots of capital inflow, but actually if you put private sector and public sector together. Asia's a capital exporter, but still the amount of capital export from Asia is uh, slowing down. And this is a part of the, I think you can think about process of global imbalancing, rebalancing. Okay, so let me skip these things. So, so far is a uh, eyeball test, and we cannot say anything about why, whether this is due to the QE or not. So that's what we want to look at the more rigorous analysis. So using the weekly data, uh, we want to look at whether QE can has an, any impact on these financial variables. As a uh, global variables, we will use the five-year US Treasury rate and index of global sentiment. As, as an index of global sentiment and market volatility, we will look, we will look at the uh, behavior of the volatility index. And as a representative commodity prices, we will look at the change in oil prices. As an explanatory variables, we have uh, 10 dummy variables, which representing the date of the QE1, QE2, and QE3. And in the morning, uh, many people already mentioned QE 1, 2, 3, so I don't, wouldn't define uh, 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 the, the, you know, the, what this dummies means. It's a, the week, Wednesday of the, that QE announcement was, was made. And then as an endogenous variable, we'll look at the impact of U.S. interest rate, volatilities, and commodity prices. I think uh, let me skip the tables. I'll just show mention the result. We found that many, as, as, as in many other researchers, it's only QE1, which has a large impact on uh, US interest rate and volatility. QE2 and QE3 event uh, impact was not uh, statistically significant. And then uh, 
QE's effect on uh, uh, the commodity prices, so I mean oil prices, kind of unclear. Okay, that is. But on the other hand, QE's impact on volatility is quite significant. When the QE has happened, the volatility of the financial market reduced significantly, and then the impact of volatility on commodity prices is quite strong. So what we are believing is that the U.S. interest rate may capture two impacts. One is the expectation on future business conditions, and the other one is the impact of QE. So in some sense, the QE contribute to reduce the volatility of the global financial market. That caused the oil price increase. Uh, because of that channel, I think if you just put together U.S. interest rate and QE together, the impact is mostly captured by the volatility uh, indicators. Okay. So finally, we look at the impact of Asian financial variables. So as a, a dependent variable which captures the impact on Asian financial variables, we use credit default uh, swaps of each country and the local currency bond yield and the nominal exchange rate. And then explanatory variables, uh, basically we put the dummies and then also global variables such as US interest rate, volatility indicators, and also uh, the uh, vol volatility indicators. And we are assuming uh, in some sense to have some kind of, uh, okay, so the variance decomposition kind of idea. We assume in the regression that country default swap, uh, credit default swap, credit default swap of country can affect its uh, domestic e uh, bond yield, and, but not, not the other way around. And uh, this uh, credit default swap and bond yield can affect exchange rate, but not the other around. So we have a, some kind of causality assumption in our regression. We tried the other form, but I think this seems to uh, give a more reasonable outcomes. Okay, so uh, we run this regression by country by country rather than, uh, you know, pooling together. So it's very hard to summarize the whole tables. So this table shows that the plus, plus, plus means that the very significant impact on plus, zero means no effect, minus means, uh, you know, negative impact. So we just have uh, some our own subjective uh, you know, evaluation based on each country's you know, country by country regression. The result, we find that the QE1 uh, uh, have a pronounced effect on domestic financial variables in Asia, but we uh, do not see significant impact on uh, QE2 and QE3. Okay? And QE1 generally lowered the uh, uh, credit default swaps and the in uh, domestic interest rate, and, but also some evidence of increase, uh, appreciate uh, the currencies, especially in Japan. The currency appreciation in the beginning of QE1 was quite significant. So our interpretation is that QE influence, influenced Asian financial market through impact on global variables. It uh, lowered, uh, it definitely lowered the credit default swap of the, each Asian countries by lowering the global uh, you know, volatility indicator. And then uh, also uh, exchange rate was, in general, was quite insensitive to the U.S. interest rate, uh, many people already mentioned, but uh, in Asian exchange rate movement was quite uh, you know, sensitive to the volatility indicator. So what we find is basically QE in the beginning of QE1 reduced the global volatility and that actually contributes significantly to the reducing the, uh, I mean, uh, appreciate the exchange rate, okay? Uh, and another interesting is uh, housing prices, and, uh, and there are, in this period, there are several Asian countries whose housing price increased quite significantly. For example, uh, China, Hong Kong, India, in uh, housing price increase, you know, 40 to 50 percent around this period. And we have a very interesting graph. When you actually uh, look at the uh, correlation between the real housing price increase versus uh, real effective exchange rate appreciation, we find that the countries with, uh, whose currency was much appreciated was, has less increase in housing prices. On the other hand, countries which maintained the fixed exchange, uh, virtually near fixed exchange rate system, the housing prices increased significantly. I think that fits very well to the economic theory. If you want to maintain the exchange rate uh, at a certain level, you have to do the, uh, you know, allow the money, money, money supply increase that it can increase the housing price increase. In this chart, Japan seems to be a little bit outlier, but actually this chart is drawn by 2008 December to 2012 December. But Japan's yen was depreciated significantly by end of the uh, you know, last quarter of the 2012. So if you just focus on the third quarter, Japan's point will be around here. So I think it's on, in, on, in line with uh, uh, this graph. So, uh, 
so basically the conclusion is that uh, we find that evidence suggests that QE may of, uh, go, work through two channels in Asia. One is currency appreciation through the reducing the volatility indicator, and the other one is uh, if the exchange rate is maintained, it went through the, uh, goes through the increase of the housing prices. Uh, so uh, what is the implication? I think uh, the implication is that uh, our result is that if, I'm asking, let me finish in two minutes. If somebody asks, after the QE, whether capital inflow has increased in Asia? The answer is simply no, as IMF uh, and many other find it. Capital, incre capital inflow to Asia has, an, uh, has not risen much faster than before. But on the other hand, QE actually contributed. Once the you know, capital inflow plummeted and uh, collapsed, QE contributed to rebounding of the capital inflow. I think it makes sense because you, know, you expect that after the global financial crisis, credit constraint of the advanced bank, and there was uh, lots of uncertainties. You expect that the capital inflow to emerging economies will go down. But th you can say thank, thanks to the QE, capital inflow rebound very quickly. And uh, in that process, either exchange rate appreciated, especially in Japan, uh, and especially uh, Asian economies with more open cap capital market and more developed financial market, exchange rate appreciated, or some countries which try to maintain exchange rate intact, like Hong Kong, uh, then the, the housing prices uh, uh, went up. So does that mean that uh, uh, if the advanced economies continue to do the expansion in monetary policy, the impact will be the same? That natural risk uh, you know, uh, lead to the, our discussion over the impact of the Japan's QE and the continued QE uh, in advanced economies. My view is that uh, 2008 uh, experience has very little implication on the new situation. Because as, you, uh, as I import, uh, mentioned, QE1 was, uh, significant, has a significant impact, but QE1 was uh, implemented at the highest of uncertainty after the global financial crisis. So even though uh, central bank uh, you know, increased money supply, money multiplier was really reduced, and there's not much room to go outside. But now the situation seems to be quite uh, different. Risk aptitude is quite, uh, you know, risk averseness is quite subdued. The global financial conditions, the tail events risk is much reduced. And uh, so if the advanced economies continue to uh, rely on the expansion of monetary policy, maybe this time money multiplier may increase and it may have a different uh, impact. So what we find is only QE1 is uh, it has an impact on increasing, uh, rebound to contribute to the rebounding of the capital inflows. But from now on, whether the, how much the money multiplier will increase and how much money will go outflow of the country, we have to look at it. And, but even though it happens, uh, we have uh, some studies, but we show that impact will be quite heterogeneous among Asian countries, depending on the, how much financial market are open. And also at the same time, if, you, if I stick to the Japanese cases, there are many Asian economies whose financial market is not well developed, but on the other hand, many Japanese companies are already operating, and the many countries which receive foreign direct investment from Japan directly, maybe those countries will benefit from the Japan's QE, if the, especially Japan's QE contribute, uh, is successful for reviving the Japanese economy, they can, more Japanese companies can operate on their countries. On the other hand, uh, there are countries like Germany, Korea, and there are several Asian countries which compete in the international uh, market, and uh, they have more open capital markets, and they may uh, have uh, some, ne they will probably have more negative spillover effect from through the exchange rate channel or the housing prices. So, uh, I think uh, pretty much that is what uh, we found. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Chang Yong. Uh, now we are lucky to uh, invite uh, Mr. Vargas. For okay, so let me first thank Bank of Korea for inviting me to comment this uh, very interesting paper. Uh, I will basically divide my comments on, into three parts. The first one will be a comment on capital flows, and here I will compare the experience of Asia with the one in Latin America. Then I will make some specific comments on the paper, and uh, I will end with some uh, uh, remarks on the policy implications derived by the authors in, in the paper. So let me first start with uh, my comment on capital flows. This uh, paper shows that after the Lehman crisis, uh, QE encouraged a resumption of capital inflows uh, into Asia. But the composition of these uh, capital flows was tilted toward FDI and bank loans and away from portfolio investment. In several Latin American countries, we have 
observe the opposite. And let me illustrate this with some experiences. This is Chile. The red line is uh, the size of, the, of, port of portfolio inflows. And as you can see, after 2009, those flows increase. Same thing in my country, Colombia. And perhaps the most uh, clear case is that of Mexico, in which the red line, the portfolio investment flows actually skyrocket after 2009. So this is very different from, from the experience in, in Asia. But not all Latin American countries show the same reaction. Let's see, for example, Brazil. Brazil imposed restrictions on portfolio and portfolio flows and other types of flows. And here you see a decline in portfolio inflows. And the same happened in Peru. So both in Asia and Latin America, the current accounts uh, balance has declined with the global rebalancing. In Latin America, part of this adjustment has taken the form of larger portfolio inflows, not so in Asia. The question, of course, is why? And this, I think it will be a, um, an interesting question for further research. Is that because of capital controls like in Brazil? Or is it because the initial stocks of portfolio investment in Asia were very high and in Latin America relatively low? So that's, I think, a to an interesting topic for further research. Now let me move to some comments, some specific comments on, on the results of the paper. The first one is uh, a comment on the robustness of the result. This is rather technical. Uh, they use a high frequency, high frequency uh, financial data, which, of course, is usually plagued, plagued with, um, with heteroscedasticity problem. And that probably implies pro uh, some problems in the inference uh, because they use OLS as an estimating uh, method. So to, to test, to have an idea, a flavor of the robustness of the result, we estimated a GARCH model, which of course takes into account the, the heteroscedasticity problem for the CDS of several countries using uh, an spe uh, a specification which is uh, rather close to the one used in the paper, that is the CDS uh, are uh, modeled as a, a function of past values of the CDS, the VIX, and the same dummy variables for quantitative easing used by the authors. And here are the results for some countries in Asia. The, the black numbers are the coefficients on the dummy variables uh, that are significant at 5%. The red ones are not significant at, at 5%. And the general result here is that you see black almost everywhere. That is that in contrast to the results of the paper with the OLS, there is no clear pattern of greater impact of QE1 versus Q, QE2 or QE3. We did the same for Latin America and basically obtained the same result. What is interesting, an interesting difference between Asia and Latin America is that for Latin America, the VIX coefficient is much larger and significant than for Asia. So it seems that we are more sensitive to movements in, in risk aversion. My second comment is also technical and it's also uh, on the robustness of the results. Uh, as uh, you heard, the estimation uh, assumes some quote unquote causality going, going from the CDS to the local uh, bond yields and then to the exchange rate. Well, this seems more appropriate for less flexible exchange rate regimes. And uh, for the sake of robustness, it will be uh, worthwhile checking the sensitivity of these results to a different order of causality going from CDS to the exchange rate to bond, especially in those countries with more um, for exchange rate flexibility like Korea. My third comment, my ther third specific comment is on the interpretation of the results. Well, the paper finds significant effects of QE1 um, and not so for QE2 and QE3. Beyond the issue of robustness that I already discussed, I think there are differences that uh, are important to understand the, the impact of uh, QE on the uh, Asian financial system. First, as mentioned by, by the author, Dr. Reed, uh, QE was a reaction to a global systemic shock in the midst of greater uncertainty regarding policy response. Nobody knew what the advanced economy central banks were going to do. Whereas QE3 and QE2 occurred after first the smaller shocks and in the context of higher certainty about the reaction of advanced economy central banks. Everybody knew that uh, these banks were um, willing to support financial markets. 
Then, of course, it is natural that QE1 entail greater corrections in asset prices and risk aversion, even in the US, as shown in the paper. This is the VIX, and it's, as you can see, the, the size of the shock is different in each, in each episode. Also, the size of the QE is different. According to the authors, uh, QE1, the total amount of uh, asset purchases in QE, QE1 it was greater than that of QE2, and the monthly average purchases of uh, QE1 and QE2 and QE are larger than, than those of QE3. So you have to take into account the size of the, of the policy intervention too. My fourth comment, my fourth specific comment is rather a question for further research. The paper finds those effects that we have already uh, commented. It will be interesting, interesting to know what is the channel of transmission. And I think the paper uh, from the BIS presented in the previous section uh, gave some, some light on, on, this, on this issue. Is it, does it work through direct effects on the, on the local bond yields? Does it work through uh, the policy responses of, uh, of, of the receiving economies? And I think this is important uh, because you will, will expect that uh, monetary expansion will be lower in countries with more flexible exchange regi rate regimes that target inflation. And this is, of course, important to explain the degree of transmission of, uh, of these uh, shocks, these quantitative easing shocks, and its macroeconomic consequences. There is also, there's a, another, an additional channel that I think it will be worthwhile exploring, and this is the influence of uh, quantitative easing on local risk premia. And this is uh, important, especially in, in the case of, of Colombia and perhaps other countries in Latin America, to assess the impact of quantitative easing on domestic uh, credit supply, the aggregate expenditure, and asset prices. And let me illustrate this with some data for, for Colombia. I think we, we, I, I'm showing here that there is a non-trivial positive correlation between local risk premia measured as the spread between Com uh, commercial and consumer lending interest rates and local government interest rates. These are the, the red and the green lines. And these two lines are correlated with the, to, the, to the blue line, which is the CDS. So there is this correlation. And one wonders if uh, an unwinding of the quantitative easing in the US and other advanced economies will hit emerging economies not only through the di direct impact on uh, uh, sovereign local bond yields or the reaction of the policy reaction, but also on the risk premia, uh, on the domestic risk premia in emerging economies. And let me finish with some general comments uh, focused on, on the policy implications that are in the conclusion of the paper. First, the authors rightly suggest uh, the eventual need for macroprudential policy responses in the wake of monetary expansion in the industrialized world. Well, yes, uh, I think I agree with this. We in, in Latin America and in Colombia in particular have used macroprudential policies to respond to this. But I think you have to be careful because using these policies for a long uh, an indefinite period Entails the, risk, entails the risk of circumvention to un, through unmonitored means. And hence, this implies hidden risks for financial stability. You don't know where the risks are because capital will be uh, flowing through unmonitored means. My second uh, policy-related uh, comment is regarding international reserves. The authors recommend keeping an adequate stock of international reserves in line with the rising volatility of financial flows. Well, I think the history supports the wisdom of, of this uh, advice. But again, you have to be very careful to, to do so without excessively removing exchange rate volatility. According to our experience, some exchange rate volatility is welcome to discourage the emergence of large currency mismatches and to reduce the exchange rate pass through. And these conditions are very important to allow the exchange rate to work as a shock absorber once you have this unwinding of, uh, of QE in, in advanced economies and to allow the, uh, the, the functioning of uh, counter-cyclical monetary policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vargas. Now, let me uh, move to the, uh, Dr. Choi's uh, paper presentation.
Thanks for having me here. Uh, this presentation is uh, based on a joint project by Young Ju Lee, Tessu Kang, and Gan uh, Yang uh, Kim. Uh, let me quickly go over, uh, given the time constraint, so that uh, uh, we can have a more uh, open discussion afterwards. Um, so we have uh, the following motivations to start with. Uh, we know that the global liquidity has a multifaceted um, momentum. momentum. Uh, since uh, liquidity is generated by both the policy and the markets. So uh, we know that <coughs> um, liquidity uh, uh, is uh, uh, generated by uh, cross-border uh, uh, capital uh, flows and also um, uh, 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 from the market uh, through financial innovations. Uh, we try to decompose uh, global liquidity into policy-driven exogenous factor and the market-driven endogenous supply and the risk factors. And then uh, we uh, come up with the, the following questions. How do emerging market economies policies respond to global liqu liquidity moment momenta? How do global liquidity momenta then affect the core activities of emerging market economies? Are uh, emerging market economies policies effective then in, in dealing with uh, the impact of a global uh, liquidity shocks? And then we try to uh, draw some policy implications in the end. Um, this chart motivates uh, the, um, um, the impact of global liquidity um, on emerging market economies. Uh, we uh, presume that there is uh, some uh, causal uh, link uh, between the two. Uh, advanced economies um, generate uh, global liquidity, and uh, such global liquidity uh, has uh, three uh, factors, as uh, uh, explained. Uh, exogenous, uh, endogenous, and the risk averseness uh, factors. Uh, then emerging market economies uh, uh, try to respond to uh, global liquidity uh, through policies uh, such as uh, monetary policy and the uh, foreign exchange uh, uh, market intervention. And then uh, uh, th such policies will have an impact on financial markets and then uh, uh, the real sector of the economy. So uh, this chart also then suggests um, global liquidity dynamics uh, which we uh, uh, try to extract um, um, uh, from uh, a model, uh, a principal uh, component of analysis, uh, which is, uh, and the such uh, global liquidity dynamics uh, should be independent of uh, our real uh, cycles. Um, there are three uh, factors, um, as I said, uh, market liquidity uh, creation, which is uh, endogenous liquidity, and uh, uh, there, there is another market-based uh, 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 liquidity, risk aversion, uh, or risk appetite. And then we have uh, the most powerful uh, liquidity, uh, which is uh, through a multi policy. Um, then uh, these three uh, liquidity momenta uh, will have an impact on uh, financial markets and the, the real sector of the emerging market economies. But uh, uh, there could be a line of defenses uh, by emerging market uh, economies. Uh, multi policy, exchange policy, or uh, FX market interventions uh, could be a line of defenses. So uh, let's then uh, uh, try to uh, decompose uh, global liquidity uh, into three factors. If we look at the exi existing studies, uh, there are many uh, measures. Uh, for example, quantity-based based measures uh, could be found uh, from uh, various studies. For example, uh, aggregation of M2, uh, cross-border credit, or non-core uh, liabilities uh, are examples. And we can also, take a, we can also uh, find uh, price-based measures. Uh, for example, uh, real interest rate uh, could be uh, one of uh, uh, typical examples. And we can also uh, take a look at bid ask spread on asset uh, to measure uh, market liquidity. Uh, this study uh, will emphasize uh, factor-based measures in the sense that we try to uh, extract uh, different components of global liquidity uh, using some uh, method. Uh, which is uh, um, adopted by uh, BIS recently. So according to these factor-based measures, uh, we uh, incorporate both quantity and the price-based measures uh, in, the in the variable set. Uh, the data comprises five countries, G5 countries, uh, and uh, uh, the data uh, have uh, eight variables, uh, overnight correlate, uh, treasury bill rate, real interest rate, and the spread between lending rate and overnight call rate, and we have a monetary base, and a private domestic credit, international claims, and the stock prices. 
And this uh, data set uh, is uh, uh, quarterly data starting from 1990, okay? And uh, um, uh, each country has a different uh, economic size, so uh, the variable uh, will be weighted by GDP, okay? Um, as I said, uh, global liquidity factors will be independent of uh, um, uh, business cycles, so we approach the data by real GDP and the uh, producer prices. Uh, this chart shows uh, G5 uh, countries' uh, key data. As you see, overnight call uh, has uh, some uh, downward uh, trend over time, and uh, you see uh, domestic credit on the right-hand side, and uh, you also have uh, stock prices uh, on, the, uh, on the bottom right-hand side. Um, you can uh, easily uh, figure out how stock prices have moved um, uh, during the crisis and uh, during the uh, global financial crisis and the European uh, debt uh, uh, crisis. Now, we have to <coughs> identify uh, three uh, global liquidity uh, momenta. Uh, to have an identification, uh, we impose assigned restrictions. Um, we impose minimal set of uh, restrictions uh, for uh, robustness. For example, uh, exogenous liquidity will have a, a negative effect on overnight call rate and a negative effect on treasury bill rate but uh, uh, exogenous liquidity will push up uh, lending rate spread in the sense that uh, the lending rate, um, uh, if the uh, endogenous uh, uh, liquidity component remains the same, uh, the, lending, uh, the lending rate spread uh, will uh, go up as the policy rate goes down. And the endogenous liquidity will push up uh, private domestic credit and the stock prices. Lastly, if there is a heightened uh, uh, risk averseness, and then our private uh, domestic credit uh, will go down. Okay, so um, using these uh, um, uh, sign restrictions, then we extract uh, global liquidity momenta, and uh, we try to explain uh, macro financial bar uh, variables. Uh, exogenous uh, liquidity explains 36%, endogenous liquidity, 16% and the risk averseness, 11% of advanced economies are variables. So these three uh, global liquidity factors overall explain 62% of the data variability. Specifically, if we look at the uh, exogenous liquidity, this one uh, can explain 64% of overnight call rate on average uh, for, uh, G, uh, for uh, G5 countries. And uh, if we have uh, a weighted uh, average, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the mean of eight variables, uh, then uh, we end up with a, a 36% uh, explained by uh, exogenous uh, liquidity and so on. So if we uh, add all uh, contributions by uh, liquidity components, then uh, uh, such uh, could explain 62% of data uh, variability. Um, the next uh, slide shows uh, um, the contribution of GL momenta by country. So these three factors uh, together can explain 75% uh, of US variables and 53% of UK variables. So for most uh, countries, uh, it's quite substantive. It's more than 40% of their data uh, variability. Now, uh, it's uh, quite uh, interesting to look at uh, the three factors uh, movements over time. So uh, if we look at the first one, uh, exogenous uh, liquidity factor, um, in the run-up to a great, uh, great uh, sorry, uh, global financial crisis, exogenous uh, uh, global liquidity factor took off um, after the 2001 uh, US recession. And uh, um, uh, this um, uh, uh, exogenous global liquidity increase is uh, followed by increase in endogenous uh, liquidity factor from 2004. And also, uh, we see uh, a decreased, reduced uh, risk averseness uh, uh, global liquidity factor uh, from 2004. And after the GFC, uh, we see uh, uh, increased uh, global liquidity factor, as seen here. And then uh, we see uh, 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 leveled off uh, endogenous liquidity factor, and uh, we have a uh, um, heightened uh, risk averseness factor after the GFC. Um, then. Uh, the most um, relevant part would be uh, analyzing uh, the impact of global liquidity uh, on uh, emerging market economies. So uh, we have uh, uh, two dimensions here. Uh, we first look at uh, the impact of uh, global liquidity on uh, EME's uh, policies. And then uh, we will take a look at 
the impact of GL factors on emerging market uh, economies or uh, uh, core sectors. Okay, so in terms of uh, uh, methodology, uh, let me uh, just uh, briefly touch uh, the, the essence. So uh, we uh, employ uh, factor augmented back to the auto regression model extended to a uh, panel uh, data analysis, okay? And uh, uh, this panel data uh, comprises 16 uh, emerging market economies. So mostly uh, um, uh, uh, strong emerging uh, economies are included. And the data uh, start from uh, 1995, first quarter. Uh, and this uh, starting period is uh, dominated by the data availability at quarterly frequency. And we have a variables, nine variables altogether, but we have two systems. Um, one is for policy responses, and the other one is the impact on the core sectors of the emerging market economies. Um, this chart summarizes emerging market economies uh, key data um, by just a chart. So um, if you are interested, uh, you can take a look. Uh, take a look. But basically, uh, all these uh, data movements uh, are consistent with what uh, uh, we could expect. Uh, for example, uh, we, if we look at here stock prices, uh, stock prices has been uh, uh, changing uh, over time, and there was a sharp uh, decrease uh, in stock prices uh, during the uh, uh, global financial crisis, and uh, then uh, a rebound afterwards. And there has been a, a decrease and then a rebound uh, afterwards, and so on. Okay. All right. Now uh, we. Uh, Uh, we uh, then uh, take a look at uh, the impulse response um, uh, analysis results. Uh, before getting into that, uh, we uh, uh, make clear what we are trying to do. Uh, we have extracted uh, uh, three global liquidity uh, momenta. So um, uh, we can uh, say that as uh, uh, triangular uh, global liquidity. Okay. And uh, in the forefront, uh, there will be multi-policy uh, in advanced economies. And there could be uh, endogenous uh, global liquidity components on both sides. And as such, it will have an impact on uh, the uh, show of emerging market economies. Uh, emerging market economies will respond to global liquidity uh, by changing um, uh, policy instruments, including uh, overnight call rates, uh, foreign reserves, and uh, 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 if exchange rate uh, if uh, 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 they uh, 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 choose to do so. But uh, noted that the exchange rates and the foreign reserves, uh, they, they are uh, uh, very closely associated with each other. Okay. And we uh, will take a look at the, uh, the impact of global liquidity on output uh, prices, stock prices, and uh, current account. Uh, here, capital flows uh, will be uh, along the uh, show of the emerging market economies. So capital flows are also uh, included in the variable set. Okay. So uh, this one um, <clears throat> summarizes um, policy responses against the uh, uh, global liquidity shock. We have uh, uh, exogenous liquidity shock first. Uh, when uh, there is an uh, exogenous uh, liquidity expansion, and then emerging market uh, will uh, cut uh, policy rates. And uh, we see here um, uh, unclear uh, movement in M2 uh, because uh, uh, there will be sterilization to check inflation uh, pressure. Uh, we see foreign reserve uh, increases uh, with the uh, capital inflows. And uh, there will be uh, uh, exchange rate appreciations with a lag. So extra capital flows uh, uh, into emerging market economies are translated then uh, into foreign reserve accumulation. Uh, since uh, the signal of this shock uh, is clear, the monetary authorities of emerging market economies will employ both measures, say uh, policy rates and uh, foreign reserve adjustments to absorb uh, foreign liquidity shock. Now let's look at the case of endogenous liquidity uh, uh, shock. Um, in this case, uh, the response of policy rate is not pronounced because they don't know uh, where uh, the liquidity increase happens uh, clearly and uh, uh, it's hard to uh, monitor uh, uh, the movements in uh, endogenous liquidity. If we look at M2, uh, there is an increase in M2. Okay, uh, we'll come back to that uh, later. 
And uh, uh, there will be increase in foreign reserves um, <clears throat> uh, because uh, there will be uh, capital inflows, and then uh, uh, there will be uh, some uh, 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 responses um, uh, to capital inflows indirectly. And uh, uh, here uh, we see uh, exchange rate appreciation followed by depreciation. Okay, so it's a bit different from um, uh, the previous case. Okay, um, now extra capital inflows into emerging market economies are first released into the economies and then absorbed partly through foreign reserves. Okay. Unlike the case of exogenous uh, liquidity shock, the signal of this shock is indirect and diffused. So uh, there would be uh, M2 increases. Um, uh, this uh, uh, M2 increases uh, could be uh, uh, the result of accommodation of uh, liquidity flows into emerging markets, but uh, in, very, in various ways. Uh, and it uh, seems that uh, the intervention to capital inflow uh, is not uh, uh, full in this case. As a result, uh, uh, M2 uh, will be uh, uh, increased uh, with the capital flows. The third case is uh, the shock uh, uh, in risk averseness. Uh, in this case, uh, there could be, if uh, it's uh, quite uh, um, uh, strong, uh, there could be uh, reversals in capital flows. So to retain capital outflow, uh, policy rate uh, would be increased. Okay. In this case, um, M2 would be increased over the medium term. Uh, that's uh, also interesting aspects. Um, and the foreign reserves uh, will be uh, decreased because of uh, capital outflows. Perceiving heightened risk averseness in the global market, uh, monetary authorities uh, will employ a policy mix, say uh, interest rate hikes and depreciations to safeguard their economies, curtailing uh, certain capital outflows. Now, uh, let's uh, uh, briefly look at the impact of uh, uh, global liquidity shocks on emerging market economies. Uh, exogenous liquidity shocks will have a positive impact on a GDP so this is uh, the case of in each, uh, in each side neighbor. And the boost strong market and the appreciate uh, emerging market uh, currencies through capital inflows. And this uh, appreciation will have uh, a downward pressure on inflation. Okay. Exogenous liquidity flows affect saving investment gap in emerging market economies. So um, you see here uh, initial uh, improvement in current account uh, in uh, EMEs. And then uh, there will be a deterioration uh, in current account as um, uh, e uh, effective exchange rate um, appreciation uh, gains momentum. In this case, um, uh, global uh, imbalance could be widened shortly. Okay. Now uh, let's uh, uh, take a look at the case of uh, endogenous uh, liquidity shock. Um, likewise, uh, on, uh, like uh, the case of exogenous liquidity, uh, GDP will be boosted and the stock prices will be boosted. Uh, but uh, it could have a, a differential impact on uh, current account and uh, nominal uh, uh, exchange rates. Okay. Um, here, uh, nominal exchange rate um, uh, will appreciate uh, uh, in the short run, but uh, would be uh, de uh, depreciated over time in this case because of uh, uh, current account deterioration. The impact of this shock um, are less clear. Uh, CPI inflation could be explained by, pa by pass-through from global commodity inflation uh, brought by liquidity outflows, overflows uh, from advanced economies. Okay. And we have a current account uh, deficit associated with uh, monetary expansion uh, and uh, additional absorption caused by capital inflows. Okay. Um, we see um, Okay, uh, we see uh, the last case, uh, heightened risk averseness. Uh, this one uh, will have a, a negative impact on output and the stock prices. And the uh, exchange rate will depreciate as a result of capital outflows. And then such will, ha will have over the pressure on prices. And the current account uh, will uh, have an improvement uh, over time, but it's not very significant. Now uh, we have uh, some uh, exercise uh, using the model. Uh, to see uh, how uh, the policy uh, would have an uh, uh, impact, uh, impact on the economy. But uh, this uh, uh, is based on counterfactual analysis, and I would like to uh, just uh, summarize the results uh, because of a time constraint. Okay. Um, 
Um, global liquidity has a multifaceted uh, moment, as uh, um, uh, I um, argued, and we have uh, three components, uh, and uh, they have uh, moved in various ways in terms of timing, fronts, and the intensity. Uh, and the emerging markets have uh, significantly responded to exogenous um, uh, global liquidity on the shore of waves, but have not yet uh, systemically uh, responded to endogenous global liquidity. Uh, they have uh, responded um, to other endogenous global liquidity, say uh, 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 demand uh, um, side uh, global liquidity uh, driven by shift in uh, risk averseness. So if we evaluate uh, the policy response in response to uh, global liquidity shocks, uh, emerging market economies policy rates were, uh, policy, rate, uh, policy responses were quite uh, strong with respect to exo exogenous liquidity and the risk averseness. And uh, emerging market uh, uh, had uh, quite a substantial impact uh, from global liquidity expansions or uh, contractions. And in terms of policy uh, effectiveness, uh, we see a strong uh, uh, policy uh, effectiveness for exogenous uh, liquidity shocks and uh, risk averseness shocks. But uh, uh, the policy effectiveness is uh, relatively weak or uh, muted uh, with respect to endogenous liquidity. So here uh, we have a um, uh, cost and the benefits of our global liquidity shocks um, from an emerging market economy's viewpoint. So endogenous uh, global liquidity, um, <clears throat> uh, um, uh, exogenous global liquidity uh, uh, have a, a positive impact on output and the stock prices as we have seen. Um, but the policies are responsive uh, um, uh, to uh, exogenous uh, global liquidity, and if we have uh, uh, weaker policy responses, then uh, we, uh, emerging market economies will have a lower output responses, but higher price swings. Uh, this finding suggests that the global liquidity easing uh, would increase volatility of prices in emerging market economies. And uh, with respect to uh, endogenous global liquidity, policy responses are largely muted upon endogenous uh, global liquidity and are somewhat effective uh, in managing uh, capital flows uh, driven by a risk aversion. Um, endogenous liquidity boosts uh, emerging uh, uh, market economy growth and uh, may help uh, alleviate the global imbalance, but uh, drives uh, inflation and the stock prices. Um, we uh, find that uh, policy measures against endogenous liquidity have a very limited impact and uh, uh, we couldn't uh, find a strong evidence um, of policy responses to uh, endogenous uh, liquidity uh, shocks. So um, we uh, tried to find some policy uh, uh, implications um, as a conclusion. Global liquidity shocks increase the variability of uh, uh, prices, um, so uh, inflation and uh, uh, asset prices uh, of emerging market economies. And I think uh, con consulted policy actions for price and uh, pr financial stabilities by emerging market economies would be more effective uh, to uh, tamper exogenous rather than endogenous uh, global liquidity. And the emerging market economies may need to consider um, more careful and responsive policy actions uh, with respect to endogenous uh, global liquidity. So we don't have uh, yet a much uh, a clear understanding how um, uh, authorities have responded to endogenous global liquidity. And it might be useful uh, to explore how uh, macro potential measures uh, could help address uh, waves in capital flows um, uh, stemming from endogenous and the risk averseness factors of global liquidity. Uh, let me finish here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Choi. Uh, let me invite uh, uh, Dr. Akio for discussion. Okay, well, thank you very much. As others, I would like to thank the Bank of Korea for putting together such an interesting conference on such an important topic and for inviting me to participate and attend. Also, uh, I'd like to make sort of the normal comment that these are my views and not necessarily the views of the Kansas City Fed or the Federal Reserve System. So let's, let me start by the, discussing briefly the contribution of this paper. The authors state that the purpose is to study the effect of global liquidity on emerging market economies, both policies and economic activity. And I think the real question is that underlies this 
is what's the effect of quantitative easing on emerging market economies? And this is a particularly important question uh, today, given some of the changes going on in Japan. But these are very difficult questions to answer. Uh, Dr. Cho provides evidence that seems to support the idea that accommodative monetary policy in advanced economies actually benefits emerging market economies through an increase in real GDP. And to, to arrive at this conclusion, it requires answering two, two questions. First, what is global liquidity? And while the earlier sessions uh, discuss some answers, the authors provide their own measure of global liquidity. To answer these questions then requires an empirical model to answer the effect of global liquidity on prices and policies in emerging market economies. So this is the basic structure of their model as was uh, discussed. And what I want to do is talk about first talk a little bit about the left-hand side of this chart, and then talk a little bit about the right-hand side of the chart. So let me first consider the left-hand side. What is global liquidity? Well, my first question is really, why do only advanced economies determine global liquidity? Global seems to mean global. And it seems as though the authors could still calculate global liquidity using advanced and emerging economies, and then study the effect of that measure of global liquidity on emerging market economies. They then decompose global liquidity into three factors. And since the factors can be difficult to interpret sometimes, they rotate the factors using sign restrictions based on economic theory, somewhat similar to structural VARs. In terms of interpreting the three factors, they match uh, very nicely with the public and private liquidity discussed in the CGFS report that was discussed earlier today. For Dr. Cho, the private liquidity depends on endogenous supply and risk factors. For the BIS study that was mentioned earlier, it depends on credit supply and credit demand. And I would note that in the BIS study, loan supply shifts with changes in risk, so the two uh, decompositions could be quite similar. So let me take a look more closely at the three factors and look first at the exogenous liquidity factor. Since an implicit motivation for the paper is to perhaps study the effect of advanced economy QE on emerging markets, the exogenous liquidity factor may be underestimating global policy accommodation since the model does not explicitly include balance sheet policies or forward guidance. And I say not explicitly include because they do implicitly include the effects of those uh, policies through their effect on lending rates, the spread, and T-bills. However, I might still recommend including a longer term interest rate since at least for the US, the effect of QE is thought to occur through long-term rates, and perhaps including some sign restrictions on stock prices, since though that's another key effect of quantitative easing. Let me also look at the risk, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Let me look at the risk, averse, uh, risk aversion factor. This is very interesting and important, especially in the context of the current environment. And it looks about right. However, in looking at it, I was surprised at the factor during the financial crisis. It's negative at the time of Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, which is the height of the financial crisis. And then it reaches its peak in late 2009, early 2010, after the crisis has subsided. And this is contrary to, say, the Kansas City Financial Stress Index, which is actually quite similar to the VIX. It reaches its peak of almost six standard deviations above normal at the time of the Lehman crisis and when their measure is negative. It then declines fairly rapidly, averaging one quarter standard deviation when their factor reaches its peak of three standard deviations. And therefore, it might be helpful to include a volatility variable such as the VIX in calculating global liquidity. Okay, so let's next turn to the right-hand side of the model. 
And this is the model. The right-hand side describes the factor augmented VAR along with the left side. As noted earlier, in their model, global liquidity is only determined in advanced economies and then transmitted to emerging market economies. In addition, the model leaves out any trade linkages between emerging and advanced economies. So for my view, I might uh, consider a model something like this. First, advanced and emerging economies determine global liqui liquidity. Second, the arrow from global liquidity to emerging markets also goes in the opposite direction, since policy actions in emerging economies may also feed back on, policy, on global liquidity. And I also added a, an economic sector for the advanced economies, which affects uh, emerging market, uh, economic sector, and global liquidity. And these changes could be important for our globalized economy and for understanding, say, the debate about interest rates and monetary policy in the early 2000s. Were low interest rates a sign of overly accommodative monetary policy, the beginning of what John Taylor calls the Great Deviation, or a sign of the global savings glut? If the latter, then we may need feedback from emerging market economies into global liquidity. Let me turn to their uh, key question, what is the effect of global liquidity on emerging market economies, policy response, and core sectors? In one of the concerns I have in terms of the interpreting uh, this is about the significance of the results for any specific country. If you remember that chart on key EME data, for um, the average overnight call rate, for example, does not seem to vary very much, although country overnight call rates uh, move around quite a bit in both directions at the same time across all countries, indicating that there's a great deal of diversity in what's going on in the advanced economies and what's going on in the emerging market economies. Now, the effect of an exogenous liquidity shock seems plausible and expected. The exchange rate appreciates, leading to a reduction in e exports, which tends to put upward pressure on GDP. It also leads to an increase in uh, foreign reserves, capital flows, and the stock price, um, increases increasing the risk of asset bubbles, financial imbalances, and capital flow reversals. And so this is sort of the question uh, facing many economies. How do you trade these two off? Well, it looks as though in their model, real GDP increases about a quarter percentage point, suggesting that the positive effect of accommodative monetary policy on aggregate demand in the advanced economies outweigh the negative effects of exchange rate appreciation in the emerging market economies. So in terms of some concluding questions, um, I'm going to not talk about the uh, counterfactual policy exercises or the endogenous liquidity uh, examples. Also, perhaps in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the first question and go straight to the second question about what does the model suggest for today? So over the last few years, exogenous liquidity has been about two standard deviations above normal. And this would normally be a cause for a concern in the uh, advanced economies and the emerging market economies of higher inflation, asset price bubbles, or financial imbalances. However, during this time, endogenous liquidity was negative or zero, and risk aversion was very high, reaching over three standard deviations in 2010. And so my guess is that we did not see any of these problems because of the heightened global risk aversion due to the financial crisis and European crisis. My concern is with the current constellation of these factors. Exogenous liquidity remains at plus two. Endogenous liquidity has been increasing and is now slightly positive. And risk aversion has been falling from high levels and is very close to normal levels. And so this raises a, a potential about the implications going forward for inflation, 
asset prices, financial and imbalances. And so it might be interesting to actually use their model to uh, forecast economic activity and global liquidity in their, uh, in their model. So let me uh, conclude uh, by turning to a, oh, God, I went back. By reminding people of a quote by former Treasury Secretary who once famously remarked to European finance ministers, it's our currency, but your problem. Of course, you can see the differences. He was talking to Europeans uh, at that time. The results in this paper perhaps suggest that the finance ministers in the advanced economies could say, it's our liquidity and you benefit. Thank you, Craig. Um, I'd like to open the floor to the audience and if you have any questions, please uh, stand up your uh, name tag. If you have any, any very original question, you can raise two hands. Uh, so, if it is not, okay. Akito. Uh, it's rather like a little bit comment. Uh, so, Chinese paper on the event study that uh, I'm a little bit worried about the weekly windows because that's going to cause the endogeneity because bigs can spike up and then it's going to react. You know, so that can happen you know, the correlation wrong. So you, the, you know, the endogeneity is gonna happen. It could, it's, it's uh, you know, the big spikes up, then they announce something. So that's the problem. So you might wanna look at the short span or even the, although the event study with announcement could be really hard, but uh, you know, you might wanna uh, get into that uh, a little bit more carefully. And the other comment for Wungyu is actually that uh, I think you have many variables, uh, but I think you take average based on GDP, right? I think you can probably use every variable and the each country and we, you know, you can wait in the taking the principal component analysis, but uh, instead of uh, taking three factor out of eight variables, for example, for the uh, global liquidity factor, you can probably use uh, the G5 times eight variables and pro probably you can add the VIX on top. And then you assign weight when you're taking principal component, then you can use more variables. So it's gonna be more robust because taking three out of eight is a little bit of an issue in terms of factor analysis. And the, um, Reference side variable that uh, you're looking at emerging market economy, you also taking average reaction of, uh, so, so that one you're looking each country, country by country, okay. So then that, that, that's, uh, yeah, that's. Thank you. I'd like to collect the questions before asking uh, our speakers to Respond. Oh, oh, yeah. Please. So I have a question. It's 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 a thought experiment. In the uh, event studies, the all all the events relate to the U.S. But the most important events in the last year have been in Europe. And I'm wondering what people would think if we put in a dummy for July 26 and the OMTs. The interesting part of the thought experiment is that's a little bit like what you called QE1. It's not obvious that the Fed actually had to do anything in QE1 other than just say that it would do something. And that sort of, I think, speaks to global liquidity versus prices, versus expectations of central banks, versus this quantitative, quant quantity viewpoint that Soros and other people put out there. Thank you. Um. Yeah, if there's no question, I'd, I, I'd like to use my uh, prerogative as a, as a chair. I'd like to ask one question for each uh, a speaker. First, to, for Chang Yang Li, uh, you mentioned something about the use of macroprudential policies going forward. Uh, 
to deal with the uh, basically the, the global liquidity issue. But you showed in Asia the over, after the crisis, global crisis, the most predominant forms of capital flows are portfolios. But um, this is exactly the same problem in Korea because we have seen a much larger role of portfolio flows after the global financial crisis. But our macro potential policies are basically on the banks. So these flows are outside. It's not intermated through, through banks. So there's some kind of a dilemma is because so probably we can, uh, we have some comments on that. For other questions for, for, um, for Dr. Choi is, um, one, one technical issue is because there is a, a, a base money in your data. So you use sign restriction to identify uh, the three uh, liquidity factors. And particularly the exogenous liquidity factor you heavily depends on the, the, its impact on the overnight and TB rate. But probably over the past few or four years, the, the interest rates or overnight rate might have been close to zero in many advanced countries. So there's not much variation there. So probably you, you can have better identification by looking at the impact on M0. Maybe you can capture the impact of the, the QE, but also, but, but in, in a more conceptual level, it, it is a little bit difficult for me to, to think about three liquidity factors which are orthogonal to each other. I mean, it's, this is not a shock. You just extract these three factors from from the, the data and as a three principal component and you rot rotate. Uh, um, but it's not a shock or, or innovation. So probably exogenous liquidity, if you think about the policy rate, it might tend to respond to any change in risk aversion probably. So uh, if it is innovation, maybe you can, after purging those response, then you can say this is independent uh, shock but this is a whole series, so, so that was my question. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you the microphone to the Chang Yong Yi first. Uh, thank you for the wonderful comments. Uh, uh, let me first uh, uh, address the issue of the specification. And Mr. Vargas and Mr. Masmodo also mentioned whether I try uh, different, you know, specification, especially in case of the uh, uh, problem of using the weekly data. And also Mr. Porter mentioned whether we have tried uh, dummies for the European cases. Uh, if I, first of all, I think after leaving school six years ago, I think uh, I'm now at the stage of not thinking more than OLS. So that's uh, one issue. But uh, the other one is that uh, uh, the, uh, the just Actually, I'm, I should confess that I will, we were, with my course, we were more complacent to find that the QE1 is very effective. On the other hand, QE2 and QE3 uh, are not, because uh, many other existing, uh, the previous papers has that kind of results. So once we find that uh, our results are consistent, we actually didn't try uh, much more effort, even though we add some lagged variable, some other uh, you know, specification. We haven't tried GARCH, but I think you're finding that if you use a GARCH, even uh, uh, QE2 and QE3 become significant, uh, we'll look at it and then we'll, look at, uh, uh, we'll try that on more time. As for the uh, European dummies, uh, we actually in include uh, OMT, and, but the timing for the, this dummy for the QE3 is kind of, kind of very close. And uh, you know, we decided rather than focusing on two issues, whether QE1, US QE versus uh, Europeans, uh, we actually didn't report, but uh, the result, as long as I remember, was um, was not that effective because at the time, uh, the as you, if you look at the capital flow data after uh, 2010 and 11 and 10, actually capital inflow to Asia is quite uh, mitigated a lot. So uh, I, we couldn't find any significant impact. But I think, uh, especially that now Japan is doing the QE, probably uh, analyzing it more uh, rigorously about Japan's and the Europe's maybe uh, uh, important uh, topics. And there are several other you know, comments that Mr. Burgess mentioned, but I will ask you later uh, more uh, clearly, but I think I, I thank for the all comments and I'll try to incorporate later. Uh, 
As for the policy uh, uh, recommendation, uh, in as uh, you know, ADB, we always ask. We have to write a, you know, the last section of our policy recommendation. So maybe our po my our policy recommendation is not directly uh, linked with our analysis. But overall, I do not want to give a misimpression uh, that we are really trying to promote the reserve accumulation. In some sense, uh, I think uh, uh, when we say that in Korea in 2008, when uh, capital really start to outflow. Uh, we maintain the reserves. By maintaining the reserves, actually, we allow the exchange rate depreciates significantly. So, in some sense, uh, exchange rate uh, maintained reserves does not necessarily mean that uh, you want to have a rigid exchange rate system, especially depending on whether it's outflow and inflow. And also, at this moment, if I have to give a recommendation to the uh, to Korea, uh, I think the trend of the one appreciation maybe uh, continue for a while. So, maybe the first recommendation is to make uh, firms to be able to compete with, uh, uh, I mean, do the, some structural reform so that they can live with, uh, you know, appreciation, uh, you know, the trend. So probably we have to, what you have to learn from Japan and immediately is how they can survive in the last 20 years of strong yen. Probably that's the most important lesson that we have to uh, learn at this moment, which is independent of our uh, analysis. And Junior mentioned about macro uh, prudential, uh, implication of macro prudential uh, policies. And especially uh, because this is uh, mostly the portfolio investment, which is most volatile than banks. Uh, I think uh, uh, I, I can have uh, two comments. One is that uh, our experience uh, showed that uh, controlling uh, outflows is almost impossible once it started. So you may do the macro prudential policies to control the inflow of capital. But once the capital starts to outflow, I think uh, many policies become quite ineffective. That is at least what we have found in our experience in 1997 and, uh, and uh, in, in 2008. So I think uh, if you really care about uh, uh, portfolio, volatility of capital inflows, maybe rather than trying to restrict the outflows, maybe you have to do something on inflows, which may be not easy either. Second, on the other hand, I think there's a big difference between the portfolio capital inflow versus uh, you know, bank loans. First of all, if something goes bad in bank loan, it's a default problem. On the other hand, uh, in terms of portfolio investment, especially uh, the uh, equity uh, portfolio, I think there is some automatic stabilizer. Once the, you know, they leave the market, price drops significantly, so the incentive to leave the market is less. On the other hand, bond and the, you know, especially the bank debt has, has do not have that kind of automatic stabilizer, and once it becomes a serious problem, it really lead to the you know, sovereign debt crisis. So I, I think in some sense, yes, it's a, it's a portfolio uh, investment which is more volatile. But on the other hand, uh, I think uh, we shouldn't expect the government is omnipotent. So if I focus more on the uh, macro prudential uh, regulation, I may focus more on the macro prudential regulation on uh, you know, bank debt rather than the portfolio investment, even though they are maybe volatile. That's my private opinion. Wouldn't you? Um, thanks for a very uh, useful comments uh, and the questions. Uh, maybe uh, I can start with um, uh, questions from um, the audience and the junior first. Uh, the technical ones first, and then uh, we can talk about uh, deeper ones. Um, so as it regards uh, the role of uh, base money, uh, I agree uh, recently uh, 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 central banks' op uh, balance sheet operations uh, are very much important uh, in driving uh, global liquidity. Uh, so uh, uh, here uh, we include overnight call rate, and uh, uh, as noted, uh, um, uh, we impose minimal uh, sign restrictions for uh, identifications. So if we don't impose any sign restrictions, then, uh, that means that uh, uh, we uh, let uh, the data, uh, you know, uh, determines uh, its um, uh, uh, linkages with uh, um, uh, linkages among uh, variables. So uh, we uh, uh, can uh, try uh, definitely, uh, you know, uh, uh, the role of a uh, monetary base um, and uh, how, see how uh, sign restrictions on a monetary base could have an impact uh, on uh, the measurement of global liquidity. And we uh, uh, have used, uh, we have a, a principal component analysis to extract uh, three uh, global liquidity factors. 
And then uh, these three uh, uh, liquidity factors are taken as an exogenous process uh, to the system, the uh, panel bar system. So in the panel bar system, uh, actually we have uh, three uh, global liquidity factors and uh, 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 emerging market economies variables. So altogether, uh, we have uh, three variables plus five variables uh, in the system. But we have a kind of a block, uh, you know, uh, recursive system. Exogenous uh, global liquidity factors on the top, and then uh, the last um, uh, 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 is for uh, emerging market economies uh, uh, variables. So in that sense, we allow for dynamics of global liquidity, but we assume that uh, global liquidities are exogenous to emerging markets uh, macro financial variables. Um, okay, and uh, um, uh, as it regards uh, Akito's comment on the use of a weight, uh, for the extraction of a, a global liquidity component, we have used uh, um, uh, GDP as a weight uh, because there could be differential uh, influence on the overall size of global liquidity depending on the economy's size. But when uh, doing uh, uh, panel power analysis, actually we tried both. So uh, we tried uh, uh, country, uh, you know, a size weighted uh, version and also uh, unweighted version. Uh, the qualitative, uh, you know, results are very much similar. But we uh, uh, thought that uh, for countries, I think uh, for countries, it might be better to use unweighted ones because we uh, wanted to, uh, uh, you know, respect each country's uh, responses and the impacts of global liquidity. Uh, but we uh, uh, excluded um, uh, outliers. So when uh, there are very volatile movements, especially uh, exchange rates um, and uh, 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 stock prices, interest rate uh, for some countries, uh, transition emerging market economies, they have a very volatile movement for some periods. So such are controlled. Now, uh, let me go back to um, uh, Dr. Akito's um, uh, comments. Uh, maybe uh, I start with the first one. Uh, why a global liquidity is a really uh, 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 advanced economy uh, 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 liquidity? So uh, uh, this one um, uh, is right. Uh, you know, in principle, uh, your comment is uh, uh, is uh, uh, very much relevant. But we uh, reflected uh, the reality in the sense that uh, advanced economies are the source of cross-border, uh, you know, capital flows. So uh, they govern uh, the uh, major movements in uh, cross-border uh, capital flows. Uh, so that's why uh, we uh, try to uh, uh, focus on our leading uh, uh, economies um, in the global world. And uh, um, um, the second one is associated with uh, sign restrictions on uh, stock prices. Uh, as I said, we impose minimal sign restrictions. And uh, without any uh, explicit uh, restrictions on stock price movement, um, uh, risk coverseness uh, uh, could explain by a uh, single risk uh, uh, global uh, liquidity factor can explain uh, about 50% of our stock prices. So without imposing uh, sign restrictions, uh, uh, we uh, could explain uh, very much uh, asset prices uh, by risk coverseness. So um, that's why um, we didn't impose. And the third one uh, is associated with uh, uh, the volatility measure uh, VIX. And uh, we have the same thought. And we have uh, another version uh, with a big measure. And uh, the qualitative, qualitative results uh, remain lowest, although we found some differences in dynamics for some variables. But uh, uh, in the revised version, we are going to report uh, 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 another set uh, of uh, uh, experiments with the bigs. Uh, the, the last one. Uh, uh, is uh, associated with uh, uh, your uh, concluding uh, remark. Uh, why not uh, uh, forecast uh, uh, afterwards? I think uh, um, it's a very uh, exciting exercise to look forward. Uh, seems that uh, because we have uh, extracted the global liquidity factors and that those would have uh, implications for uh, the dynamics of uh, um, emerging market economies key variables. So uh, we will look forward uh, to doing that. And uh, um, the uh, comment uh, you mentioned, um, um, I think uh, it has a, a very uh, important implications. Um, uh, advanced economists might uh, say uh, uh, as follows, it's uh, um, our liquidity and uh, your benefits. Uh, to some extent, I agree with uh, uh, you know, uh, this conclusion in the sense that global liquidity expansion, especially exogenous ones, uh, uh, you know, boosted uh, output growth and uh, equity prices. But there are side effects. 
uh, equity prices, uh, exchange rates, um, uh, those uh, uh, you know, uh, move very uh, uh, volatilely uh, in response to uh, global liquidity uh, factors. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, let me add um, the last one. So uh, why do we uh, uh, say that global liquidity uh, measures are shocks? Actually, uh, we uh, extracted uh, global liquidity uh, uh, measures uh, from principal component analysis. And then in the second step, we have a, a panel bar. And then, you, you know, there are shocks uh, uh, to global liquidity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we just give, him, give them applaud about this. And, okay. and I, I, this is the last session for today. And I presume uh, there must be some housekeeping announcements for